as a consultant in satellite operations specifically. Uh, so I'm a mix of a you probably say a mix of a private and freelance consultant if you if you're using the terms from Joe Armstrong's strong keynote this morning. And I'm only one person programming part time in my contract, so I'm going to talk about how I've used Haskell at, at small scale, but to good effect at one of my customers. And that customer is SSC, the Swedish Space Corporation. And they're headquartered in Stockholm. They have a operation center in Kiruna, Sweden's northernmost city. And from there, they launch sounding rockets. They launch stratospheric balloons. In Stockholm, they develop hardware for space use. For example, these. Uh, small environmentally friendly thrusters that will be flying on Skybox Imaging's fleet, satellite fleet. They have aerospace test systems, they provide telemetry tracking and control services for satellites using their worldwide ground station and antenna network. Um, they also have, provide satellite management services to customers where they operate a spacecraft or satellite on behalf of the satellite's owners. and. One of the satellites they operate is the telecommunication satellite Sirius 3, which looks like this. It's kind of like a, I know, a, a tin can with its lid open. Um, and it's a, it's a Boeing 376 model satellite, which is a very successful satellite model. It was produced, the first one was launched in 1980 and this last one in 2003. This is a, a the spinner satellite, which means it spins around its longitudinal axis, the body of the satellite, while the reflector is kind of fixed and pointing towards the Earth. Um, and these have been largely, this kind of design has been largely replaced by probably satellites you're more familiar with, which is like a box in the middle with these two big wings with solar solar arrays, because they're more they're more efficient in terms of generating power. They have larger solar array area per per mass and per per volume that you can put on a launch vehicle. Series 3 was launched in 1998 and uh, had a design life of, well, has a design life of 12 years. So if you do the math, you'll uh, see that we're, it's four years beyond its, uh, its design life. And well, what does that mean? Well, it can mean several things. For example, hardware or um, electronics and uh, mechanism and so on on the satellite are qualified for 12 years, which means they've been lifetime tested and so on. So the kind of the the reliability kind of goes down because you really haven't, for example, tested mechanisms to be in, in space for much longer than 12 years. Um, but uh, as long as nothing really breaks, it doesn't make a big difference. Uh, the main uh, most main tangible impact is that you run low on fuel. The satellite needs fuel to, uh, it has these small rocket engines, similar to one I showed on an image before, um, that it uses to correct its orbit and its attitude. And uh, when you run out of fuel, or get low on fuel, you kind of have to start prioritizing. Nominally, the satellite should be in a geostationary orbit, this type of satellite. Um, most telecommunication satellites are in geostationary orbits, which were one of the constraints is that it should circle around the Earth in the equatorial plane of Earth, um, which is illustrated by the yellow line here, the text GSO, geostationary orbit. But you have lunar and solar gravity pertur perturbations that uh, influence the orbit and cause the orbital plane to change, and causes what we call inclination to grow. Inclination is the angle between the equatorial plane and the orbit plane. And uh, so during the design life, you, uh, you correct for this, uh, these perturbations from the sun and moon and uh, to maintain your orbit in the equatorial plane. This uses a lot of fuel. It uses most of the fuel on the satellite, actually. So when you're in this situation, you kind of have to make a trade-off. You can either have like maybe a few more months of <coughs> inclination control and then be uh, completely out of fuel, or you can uh, choose to stop controlling the inclination of the satellite and then you'll have several, uh, several years more of fuel. And, but uh, the drawback is that your, uh, your satellite, your orbit becomes inclined and something similar to the orangish, pinkish, I'm not sure what it comes off, up as their line. And the, well, the, kind of, the trade-off there is really, it's a money thing, um, <coughs> a satellite with a payload in, uh, in a geostationary orbit, you 
can charge much more for use of the satellite than you can for a satellite in, a, in an inclined orbit, typically. Now, switching gears for a bit. Um, if you thought the satellite was old, uh, well, the ground system is either even older, and uh, this is an image of one of the, of the server of the type we have in the Mission Control Center. It's a Deck uh, Vax VMS server, um, and uh, we have uh, three of these. It's uh, one primary, typically, and the two backup servers in case there's a problem with the primary one. If there is a problem, hopefully we can get some spare parts from eBay or something. If we're lucky, otherwise we only have two servers. Um, we have a little, a little bit of a stockpile as well. I say we here, I mean really my customer, but... Uh, um, and that thing on the, on the right is a printer. <laughs> um, we don't use these printers anymore, but they're still standing around like they're refrigerators, kind of. Um, the front end to these servers that are used in the Mission Control Center is their stock win Windows workstations with, uh, with an X-Windows server, and they also have Microsoft Office, Firefox installed. Um, they interact with the servers via Telnet and the X-Windows protocol and FTP for file transfer. The Mission Control Center, so both the workstations and the servers, are isolated from the office network and the internet and everything by a sneaker net. So if you need to transfer files, you put them on a USB key, go on your sneakers and walk over to the Mission Control Center or office or vice versa. This is a kind of a fuzzy uh, photo of the, um, of the satellite control software. Uh, and it's one of these funny things. The, this stuff is IPAR controlled, it's international all traffic you know, open arms regulations, an American thing, because it's an American product, so you're not allowed to really show anything readable um, in a conference or so and stuff. But at the top is some, yeah, some plots, essentially, and the time series plots, and at the bottom is a telemetry screen showing green is good, red is bad, so there's some problem here you know, when this particular photo is taken. Um, so yeah, it's X windows, so there's terminals, essentially all the software is just running in a text, text terminal, a text term. Uh, the three major software components, I'm going to talk about one of them, which is more relevant to the Haskell tools I've been writing. It's called STAY, it's the flight dynamic software, which is used for the orbit and attitude uh, measurements, maintenance, and, uh, and predictions related to this. Um, again, has you, uh, the, the interface is it's just a text-based, uh, you run a text uh, text-based uh, UI in a, in a terminal window, and it's written in. Uh, so this is, a, this is the vendor develop, delivered the software, and that was delivered with a satellite written in Fortran 77. Uh, and uh, it produces a lot of text files, which is an important part of the interface. And these text files are typically printed by an operator and uh, kept in a binder and kind of for, for easy reference. Arguably, you could just bring them up on a screen, but uh, it just makes it more cumbersome because you have to refer to these files a lot to compare. They operate the software in several stages, and it, you just have to look at the output from one stage and refer to this file to check the inputs to the next stage and so on. Um, these files look something like this. This is probably the simplest type of file in terms of format and the amount of information. And here's a, a quite complex one. They're designed for human consumption, so uh, rather than uh, for parsing, but the software has uh, some functions in it that uh, assume that the orbit is geostationary, i.e. The, the yellow line there, and uh, which was, you know, the nominal case and a valid assumption for the design life of the satellite, but now that our, the orbit of Sirius 3 is inclined, um, these functions are breaking down, and uh, the situation just gets worse, some worse as the inclination grows with time, which kind of uh, brings me to the, sets up the context for the topic of my talk here. Uh, so I, I've developed a bunch of uh, uh, Haskell tools um, to, to help them in various ways. They're all pretty small tools, but seven of them are deliverables. Three of them are specifically to address shortcomings in the vendor software related to this uh, orbit degradation, and uh, to address problems that didn't exist during the first 12 years of the satellite operations. And the other four tools are to have other purposes, to improve safety and efficiency of the operations. Um, 
essentially replacing manual work performed by the engineers and manual inputs or manual verifications and things. Kind of the origin story here is the, how I got Haskell into this. Um, was uh, I was asked to uh, fix up. They had had a project where they de were developing a tool to uh, model satellite antenna motion in this uh, when it's in this inclined orbit. And they built this kind of convoluted shell plus Excel thing and uh, tried to validate it against historical telemetry data. And it was kind of, I guess you could call it a failed project really, and they were, they were asking me, well, can you take a look, maybe you can figure out what's wrong with it and fix it up because our validation isn't really good. <laughs> uh, or it doesn't, it doesn't really match the, the telemetry data, the reference data we have. So I said, yeah, I can take a look. And I took a very quick look at the, the well, mainly the Excel file and the script, what there was like shell scripting to mangle data and to form telemetry data and to form it. Excel could use look at the Excel tool, which is this huge Excel sheet with all these opaque cells and uh, and I decided, well, I don't really want to try to track down all the reference here, references here and figure out where, where what this thing does. So I decided I'd uh, write an independent implementation in Haskell and have that as kind of a comparison, which would help me also when uh, debugging the Excel thing. And hopefully my Haskell version would be, uh, well, would, uh, would be, could be validated against the, the historical data. And it, this was successful, uh, the, the Haskell model worked well, the Haskell tool worked well. So I, so I wrote up a report about what I'd done with my Haskell tool before still ignoring the, the old tools they had built in-house. I built a report, or wrote a report about what I'd done uh, quite, a, quite rigorously about the anal analysis of the comparisons of the results, of results with the old tool with telemetry data, historical data, the reference data, uh, fancy plots and things, and, uh, and, uh, and kind of build credibility with a, a very solid analysis of, of the old tool and the new tool. And with that credibility there, so they, they kind of figure, oh, okay, he, pretty much, he, knows, he knows what he's doing here. He's kind of figured this out that we struggled with. Uh, with that, I took the opportunity to pitch Haskell when I established that credibility and uh, said, well, you know, if you ask me, I think the best choice is to continue developing this in Haskell um, rather than trying to go back and uh, fix the Excel tool. Or if you want, I could start over from scratch in your programming language of your choice, Fortran, uh, MATLAB, C, whatever, but uh, Java, but uh, I think essentially that I thought Haskell was the best idea, and uh, the points that I pushed on were points that Joe Armstrong mentioned again this morning, correctness, ILS bugs, and uh, time to market that I could just do it much quicker, especially as I already had you know, the, the model in place, I just need to do some wrapping around it to make it an operational tool. Uh, so that's kind of how I got, the, got Haskell into the, into the room. And, uh, so, I'm thinking I'm looking at the clock here, and I plan to share some of, something on the design and development of these tools, but I won't go into too much detail. Um, you have the, five minutes yeah. before questions, and then... So. Sure. They're all command line interface tools, so it, it's, everything's very simple, and uh, they just they ask for some inputs, prompt for inputs, they fetch files from the VAX VMS servers using FTP, they process these files and produce outputs on standard out. Now the processing can have various varying degrees of complexity. Um, this is the, well effectively the, the interface to the command line tools, right? The options here is a more complex one. Um, these uh, I use the the all parts applicative uh, uh, library for these options and I, I like uh, I like it. it but, Turns out, I mean, I like these screens and stuff. It works pretty well. I wrap these command line tools and, and batch files that I put on the on the desktop of these uh, Windows workstations and the control center for easy access for the satellite engineers and and they'll just call the executable with the side options if the defaults aren't good and they'll override them and they redirect redirect the output to a to a file and the file gets opened then afterwards for viewing and it 
it could be it just opens a new notepad and they just review the results or send it to the printer if they want to print out of it. I develop on my Mac, test with a mock FTP server, use Cabal sandboxes and Cabal freeze to manage dependencies, um, which I think is, a, is critical um, in this case. And I then I move the code to the a desktop Windows uh, computer, office computer, and compile a executable there. Um, now, GAC puts everything in a statically linked, self-contained executable, which is very <coughs> convenient because then I just put that on my USB key and walk over to the Mission Control Center and uh, and install install the executable there. Um, I want to talk about. I think I'll skip this. Some kind of use of it in the domain specific language. This is about sensors on the satellite that monitor the Earth and then get blinded by the sun, and this has to be predicted. The, the software in stay, the vendor software, and um, that function has uh, broken down now with inclined orbits, so I kind of have one, ap um, one application that uh, replaces that functionality, and uh, just want to highlight here the kind of you can get these mini uh, embedded domain specific languages quite, quite simply in Haskell where something, body of the data types at the top. Body could be sun or moon, um, sensor could be north earth sensor, south earth sensor. So you have it highlighted here, it could be like north earth sensor enters the, uh, or oh, sorry, the sun enters the north earth sensor at time t. And it kind of, if you squint away the punctuation, it really, it reads quite nicely. Uh, have a library with the statically check physical dimensions, which, well, uh, Causes confusing, yeah, confusing different physical dimensions with each other is uh, causes it to be a type error, uh, similar to uh, with what's available in F, F, F sharp. And uh, this is a particular well-behaved error message. It's not always that that nice and straightforward, but at least you get a type error either way. Uh, here's an example of I I read a lot of the this type of code or have a lot of uh, like. Classical mechanics computations and things in my code, and here's with the with the optional type signatures removed. So it's not this isn't really super complex, but there's still you know there's opportunities for for mistakes and typos and stuff. But uh, most of them are eliminated by dimensional uh, by using this library. And uh, I'm not quite sure why that showed up again. Okay, I use the chart library to produce some uh, some SVG charts in SVG format that uh, that they can just open in the Firefox web browser that happened to be installed in the Mission Control Center. I don't know why it's installed since there's no internet there, but maybe someone else had some need. So, <laughs> so I just uh, reuse that. Um, yeah, And uh, I also use something that's critical here is the charts diagram back end that was built last year. I'm going to skip over this. Parsec, parse these files, parser. So, some metrics might be interesting for you. Um, th this, these are all small applications, right? The, I think the biggest one took maybe 60 hours. I would put on the uh, invested in the second checker. And some of these took, you know, two hours and uh, some about a week. Um, AstroStay is the, that's a library, a proprietary library, and then I have some public libraries that I reuse um, that are from that I have on GitHub. So quite a, well, plenty of lines of code there, but not very many I've written specifically for, for this this customer, this work. Yeah. Now it's not there's not a whole lot of lines of code, but in terms of of bugs and bugs that made it to production, I only really reflected over this today. There have been none. No, no implementation bugs. Let's say sometimes I, you know, I, I designed the wrong thing. Or let's say I realized later that oh, okay, we need to do this a different way. But uh, but whatever I have uh, delivered has already really always done what's what's been intended. And uh, I'm not going to take credit for that my, myself. But it's uh, really thank you to thank you for the types and uh, DHC for enforcing the types. Thanks to Dimensional. Thanks to the quality libraries on Hackers for that. I've also not had any bugs that I've noted, and uh, quick check in HPEC, the testing tools that I've been using mostly. Um, uh, a big remaining remaining thing is handing over the code, and this is kind of, uh, not sure how this will go, I haven't done this yet, um, to be done during the autumn, and uh, 
I need to hand over the code for maintenance by the satellite engineers. They're not really programmers either. They, uh, some of them, they've done some, uh, done some MATLAB and um, maybe taken an imperative uh, programming course in university or something. So it's kind of a challenge here to, uh, it will be a challenge to kind of get them introduced to Haskell, Capel, Git, and uh, maybe the rever reverse order is the way to go, kind of, okay, this is how you check out the code, this is how you build it, and then, you know, then start worrying about how to change it. Uh, and kind of just brainstorming how what I have to do, documentation, check out build deploy procedures, an intro to Haskell probably work through some delivered code, pointers to uh, online resources or printed resources. Um, this is kind of an area. If anyone has good ideas there, please please do share them, even with questions or later. Uh, some some things I'm thinking, you know, keep it as simple as possible. Um, use uh, use do notation where available. Uh, um, I probably don't use lens, sorry Ed, <laughs> but uh, yeah, just stick with the reg record syntax. Um, I'm not sure about like applicative operators, very convenient and stuff, but maybe maybe try to avoid them. Oops. Um, and uh, quite quite a big thing actually. I wish it wasn't, but protect beginners from from Cabal or the problems with Cabal. Um, try to. Uh, Build everything in Cabal sandboxes and use Cabal free, so I can just and keep the Cabal the the Cabal config file, I guess it's called, in GitHub, so that uh, they don't get burnt by a random uh, dependency update on or a package update on a package. Um, so getting to some good or bad things. <laughs> I think I've kind of mentioned these. Um, I, I mentioned the easy installs again. Th this is really critical to getting things in the Mission Control Center environment because, well, it's sneaking it for a reason, right? They want to keep uh, keep things simple. And if I had to install whatever Cairo and Poplar or uh, or a lot of uh, other libraries, it would be just be a headache. Um, bad things: FTP and laziness. I haven't really touched on this, but uh, I'll say something bad about Haskell, and it's. Uh, there's one. There's an area where laziness bit me a little bit, and then some cabal headaches, especially when uh, moving to a new version of the compiler earlier this year. And Sorry about this, that. Yeah, you, you were involved there. Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, uh, it's, uh, I learned some new uh, cabal flags and stuff too that kind of work for me, um, and it got things resolved pretty quickly. Not a problem anymore. But but it's the thing that can come and bite you. If I mean, who knows whether the 7.10 or something else is gonna or whatever. Uh, I think I'll just leave it there and skip over this FTP thing. There's a, well, you need to do a strictness thing when you use the FTPHS library from John Gerson, which, as far as I know, is the only uh, pure Haskell FTP library mm. around, but and it's worked very well, except for yeah, this minor thing. And the unknown here is handing over the code maintenance. So, thank you for listening. Now, to Two minutes for questions, I, I guess. Yes, thank you. And if, uh, <laughs> and if the next presenter wants to, or do we have a break? Mm -hmm. We a short break, no? Yeah, we have, yeah, we have a short break. Okay, yes. yeah, that's good. Okay, go ahead, Tim. Actually, uh, thanks. So. It was a pretty entertaining talk. Um, I don't know if you remember or have seen Mark Jones's talk uh, playing the DSL card from ICFP08, but. Um, my question was going to be, so to spoil the talk for you, um, sure. he had an experience uh, contracting for an aerospace company, uh, not contracting some sort of research grant cooperative thing. Anyway, he you know developed this wonderful DSL for this company that had some very old crafty code, and he presented it to them, and they said eventually, well, this is, this is great, you know, we love this, it's awesome, but it's too theoretical, we can't use it because our engineers just mostly aren't good enough to understand it, so... I was thinking at the end, well, you know, how are you going to prevent that kind of a situation? You did, and then next you did put up a few um, ideas about that. But in any case, uh, if nothing else, I wanted to recommend to watching that talk if you can find it. Okay, yeah, that's a good one, a good one. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Um, uh, yeah, keep, um, keep, I can, I can come on with you, maybe you can write it down for me. Oh, yeah, What, yeah, what sure. I'm looking for, but yeah. Um, yeah, it's, uh, well, I don't know, I don't really have anything. To say I don't know how this will pan out. The good thing is I've been paid for writing the code already. But uh. <laughs> right. I mean, from a purely selfish point of view, you're all good. From a, <laughs> yeah, no, uh, making Haskell take over the world and beyond point of view, well, 
<laughs> yeah, no. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, yeah, right. Like, the options really were just to pick an imperative language and teach them an imperative language because really they're not software developers. So maybe this is a good opportunity. Looking at these like these slides of Erlang, uh, how easy it was to learn Erlang and stuff, and uh, Michael's problems with uh, programmers not learning, I guess, uh, imperative programming. Uh, you know, maybe it'll go much smoother than I'm expecting. Um, maybe they'll, you know, it'll just they won't have this problem of uh, of unlearning things. I hope. We'll see. Anyone else? I'm, I'm not a Haskell user, but uh, I was fascinated by your Cabal workarounds there. Could you explain what those <laughs> nice <laughs> jobs and nice ones? Uh, well, um, I can nice probably one. do so, maybe, if need be. Uh, let me see you. Where were they? There. These ones. Yeah. I hardly know myself. Max Max jumps. It's something about the trying to find a solution of, uh, of the dependencies that uh, will cooperate with each there other. Right. Minus, like, minus one is infinite. Kind of. Yeah. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. So just keep trying instead of bailing after I don't know how many tries. Is and, so, and so is the transformer something to do with monad transformers? Or yes. Is that, sorry, right. It's yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. It's right. Oh, so, right, right. So it's a combination of trying to get the set solver to give you a solution and also to um, exclude libraries. Yes. This, this is to ignore upper dependency bounds, kind of, on this on this package. And this this is like an example. It could be any depending on what the next situation is going to be. The next time I have a Cabell problem, it might be something else there. I have to. Uh, we did a new major release on transformers, mm -hmm. and then I have a small compatibility shim that makes it easier for people who want to still support the old library but need the new features. Right. And um, there turns out to be a small bug in the backtracking solver for Cabal that would cause it to skip one of the three cases that I had. So it would backtrack out of one, and then it wouldn't try the other, and then it would try the... Try the so the max back would just keep trying until it finds a solution? Well, this just turned out to, with the reorder goals, to be just enough secret sauce to make it work, and then we shipped out a new version of Cabal. Perfect, thank you. And then that still had a bug, and then we had to ship out another in, version. In Cabal's defense here, though, like this was when you unfroze it, right? You didn't have any breakages until you tried to unfreeze and pick up the No, I, this was no. before I'd even started freezing stuff. Oh, okay. yes, yeah. No, no, no this, this, this was an actual cabal bug. This one was <laughs> Google Cabal. I wasn't the only one. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll stop eating into your break. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. I'll give it to you.